the talk today is Empowering Connections, Promoting First Relationships Between Children with Significant Support Needs and Their Caregivers. And it's my pleasure to introduce Jessica Chandler. She's the Associate Director of Outreach Birth to Five Services, a statewide coordinator of Birth to Three Services for children who are blind or have low vision at the Washington State School for the Blind. Jessica has been immersed in the field of blindness and low vision since 2007, where her passion lies in working closely with families. She's also certified in infant massage and is a certified promoting first relationships provider. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and invite Jessica to share her screen. And again, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you so much, Monica. Um, it's a nice introduction. I appreciate that. Um, first and foremost, um, I am from Washington, so I am going to really try to um, hold my um, acronyms um, or be accountable for my acronyms and, and explain um, some of those so that it is not confusing for you folks. Um, but I am from Washington State School for the Blind. And in the state of Washington, we have early supports for infants and toddlers, and that is our birth to three system. We're gonna take a second now. I'd love to hear from you. Um, Maureen's gonna run a poll for us. And we would like to know, how would you describe your familiarity with promoting first relationships? We have a lot of folks that are very familiar, somewhat familiar and even folks that are not familiar. This will kind of help me with my next few slides. Great that we have um, people joining us that are just becoming familiar with promoting first relationships. It looks like about half of us are very familiar um, with promoting first relationships um, and 31% somewhat familiar, 12% limited familiarity, and 8% not familiar at all. I will keep that in mind as I go through the next few slides. All right. We have some goals for today, and um, most of all, we're hoping that you have an enhanced understanding of um, promoting first relationships. And not only that, but you gain some practical skills um, in that um, when you're working with infants and toddlers who might be facing significant support needs and deaf blindness, you have some strategies under your belt. Some other objectives. Um, we would really hope that that critical role of uh, early social and emotional development of learners um, would you would increase your understanding there, um, especially when it comes um, to uh, uh, children that have significant support needs and those who have deaf blindness. Um, we're going to discuss some touch based early support strategies and really focus on the application of those um, in terms of um, providing positive instructive feedback with parents and how that positive and in instructive feedback can help to um, nurture uh, critical early relationships. And lastly, um, we're hoping that you walk away with some tangible tools. I have a planning worksheet that you will have um, access to. I think you might already, um, but we'll have a chance to go through that so you'll be able to utilize that. So just quickly, uh, just to let you know um, where Promoting first relationship fits in um, with our early supports for infants um, system here in the state of Washington. Um, in 2014, there uh, was an effort to um, improve uh, called the State Systematic Improvement Plan. And it was discovered that there were some inconsistencies across the state uh, when it came to uh, addressing some social and emotional concerns. So from that um, study, we were able to um, determine that there it was a need to increase um, that percentage of uh, infants and toddlers with disabilities 
um, and, and the supports that they receive for social and emotional health and um, supporting uh, the parents in um, developing those skills. So after a selective process, promoting first relationships uh, was a program that was selected um, as an evidence-based practice and um, a recommended practice. So promoting first relationships training is just one component of the state um, improvement plan, uh, but trainings are available to our birth to three staff. And um, just like me, I took advantage of that. Um, birth to three providers can take advantage of these opportunities and gain skills and how to better support families in this area. All right, when we think about uh, promoting first relationships and in the um, eyes or in terms of the provider, um, you know, providers, the role is to come in, um, use observations to support, and then also explore relationships with curiosity and also with reflection. And where I really had the opportunity to flourish and grow in this um, was offering that personalized approach. Um, what do I have to offer um, my families in terms of my expertise and being a teacher of the blind um, and working with those uh, families that have uh, children who might be blind, might have deaf blindness, um, blind with other exceptionalities. So when, when we're providing the support, we're thinking of the caregiver and we're, we're thinking of how we can help to increase confidence in parenting. We're also thinking of how can they have a deepened understanding of um, their, their child and uh, how their feelings and experiences can be acknowledged. So this is the parents' feelings and, experience, and experiences. And then we're also thinking about the child and um, how the caregiver might be able to identify and respond to the child's needs, um, how feelings and experiences can be acknowledged, and how behavior can be reframed as communication. So some of the um, evidence-based individualized um, parenting uh, program um, details, uh, we're thinking about how supports um, to parents and how they can think more deeply about the unique needs of their child and how their child communicates their emotional needs. We might have conversations about supporting um, reflection and reflective capacity about unique parenting priorities. What are the what are the parents' unique priorities for their children, and how that's rooted in culture and values? We're also sharing information about social and emotional development with the parents. And lastly, our early supports for infants and toddlers, our ESIT providers here in Washington. Um, can express increased confidence in supporting children's social and emotional development. So all of this, we're thinking about relational health. For the Centers of uh, Disease Control, uh, supporting safe, stable, nurturing relationship, or SSNRs, is a preventative strategy to improve mental and, or improve health and mental health. So as you can see in the diagram, we have an adult, and a child, and then the adult is recognizing cues and behaviors and then responding, responding to those cues and behaviors in a manner that can help the child regulate and feel safe. Some of the qualities of healthy relationships, if we think about it in terms of the qualities of the child, uh, the child can communicate distress to the caregiver and then for the caregiver, the caregiver can understand that communication and respond um, appropriately. Um, the child would be able to use their caregivers to regulate and um, the parent can respond by managing their own feelings um, and then be with their child during those stressful moments. So as you can see, all of these things are adding up to what are those um, skills that a parent might have in being able to respond effectively. Um, the child can be interested in the world around them, and parents can delight in that exploration and help um, encourage them to explore further. All right, I would love to share with you this next clip. We we're just talking about delighting in a child's exploration, and I have a lovely clip of Andy Rose, 
And this is um, it, this is uh, from the Washington uh, State, or th this is the Deaf Blind Program, has shared these videos and they're available online. And we have an opportunity here to see just how this adult can interact um, with a child and really um, delight in their explorations. On your toes. Yeah. You did it again. It's on your toes. Now it's on your mouth. It's on your ear. So that in that opportunity, we were able to see um, Andy Rose exploring with a toy and then the adult exploring or delighting in that exploration, um, really letting her take the lead and responding in a way that really lets her know that her actions are important and um, that the things that she, she is, um, you know, the, the um, actions that she's taking to learn more about her environment, um, the adult is uh, noticing and narrating. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more, some of those really specific strategies um, that, you know, help a child that might have significant support needs um, to take more risks and learn more about a world that might not be um, readily accessible to them. So in thinking of all that we just learned about the Promoting First Relationships um, program, um, I, as a provider, kind of entered this and, and wanted to um, learn about how it connected with the things and strategies that I was already working with my uh, family on. And so I was looking through a lot of research and I was able to find um, a Dutch study that really looked at harmonious um, interactions. And this is really in terms of working with um, children who are deafblind. So from the study, we were able to gather that all children need harmonious interactions. And I think that really fits nicely with the PFR framework. But one thing that was pointed out in the study is that sometimes parents need to learn um, new skills. They need to acquire specific knowledge that helps them to support their children um, when it comes to interacting with them and helping them to explore their world. So from the study, we were able to gather that harmonious interactions do what? It provides the foundation for learning and for communication. Also, teachers and parents can improve the quality of their interactions with children who are deafblind by learning new skills. And as a provider, I can help with that. We also learned that video analysis is a powerful tool for, inter um, for interaction um, when you're training folks. And the nice thing about that is, is that um, video analysis can really help in recognizing those harmonious interactions. And when we watch those videos with parents, we can help to point those things out. So that's a really um, powerful element in PFR as well. And lastly, from the study, we learned that when teachers and parents change their own attitudes and behavior, children use more positive interaction, uh, interactive behaviors and response. So here we have that um, connection with, um, you know, how parents are responding and then having that improvement with um, how children respond. So going a little bit further into um, learning the um, different elements of promoting first relationship, and then trying to tie that to some things that I had already been working with the family on and um, growing in the area of providing um, a more specific and um, tailored support system to the family. I would like to talk, talk to you just a little bit about uh, the, the training in general. So um, working with the family um, and then starting the PFR training, um, I was able to do 
a PFR level one training. And uh, that was over the course of uh, four and a half days. And then from that, I um, expressed interest into um, the uh, moving on a little bit further and doing uh, PFR level two training. So with that, it's pretty intensive. Um, it's about four hours per week. And it's, a, it's about a 10 week commitment. And in that, um, we were using video recordings um, with the family and, and, and um, really looking at those videos in terms of the interactions with um, between the parent and the child. Um, and then also kind of thinking about my approach to my practice and um, whether or not I was, you know, moving away from that expert um, stance um, and rather than expert stance, taking a more consultative stance. And through that, um, each session would really um, kind of begin with the joining. Um, we're really like establishing an emotional connection with the parent. Um, it would include some reflective questioning to learn more about what the parents' priorities are and um, maybe some um, current events in the house, what they would like to work on. Um, and then also kind of honing my ability to give positive instructive feedback. And we'll talk about that a little bit later, um, but just the difference of, um, you know, being um, providing positive feedback where you might be saying like, that's really great. I noticed you did whatever, but then um, being more um, specific in um, letting parents know what they did and how that really helps to support the child's social and emotional needs. So the family that I worked with um, was a, a, it was a family of a three-year-old. And so uh, the child had just exited our birth to three services, a summer birthday and was waiting to enter uh, preschool. So this child uh, had hearing loss and vision loss and an array of complex uh, medical needs. Uh, she was, like I said, transitioning into uh, preschool and there was a lot, little lull in services. So a July birthday, and then in the state of Washington, we start school right around um, Labor Day. So um, this was a great opportunity to kind of fill that void. Um, I did have the liberty of doing that, you know, as a um, birth to five director. Some of our providers wouldn't have that um, opportunity, but it was a great opportunity for me to kind of help um, them in that meantime. And so one thing to note is that the family um, or the parents and caregivers that I was working with had um, excellent follow through and were really invested. So um, if I would come in uh, with different strategies, um, we would talk about them. And then definitely the next time I would come in, those, those different um, approaches would have been practiced and put into place. And um, there, were, there was not really um, any issue with that. So one approach we were taking um, was how they could kind of communicate um, the importance of those strategies they were learning with the school staff. So this whole um, uh, focus on the PFR strategies and the PFR program was also um, had a little bit of a focus on how to communicate with um, this new team that would be working with this child um, that had never really left um, her home. So this was a, a big move, as you all know, transitions um, commonly are for parents. So thinking of um, the strategies we had been working on already and um, tying that together with uh, the different uh, approaches and um, with PFR, uh, we had a variety of uh, touch-based um, strategies that we were using. So when a child uh, has hearing loss, vision loss, oftentimes it's um, necessary to um, learn some strategies that parents might not innately know when it comes um, you know, to interacting and playing and providing access to a child's environment. So in thinking of these strategies, um, we were working on um, repetition. So a lot of times um, there might be opportunities throughout the day through routines and uh, we would have conversations about using um, the same language throughout those routines and um, even in inviting the other providers on the team um, to also you know, use uh, the same strategies to provide that repetition. 
Um, one of the other um, strategies we were using was to provide narration. If you think about the um, video that we just watched of Andy Rose, um, she was putting her feet on the wiggle toy and she was putting her mouth on the wiggle toy. And you could hear the adult in the video pointing that out and, and using um, specific language to help uh, provide the child with vocabulary. We talked a lot about working side by side. So um, instead of doing for a child, working alongside and doing so doing with and not for. So really being that partner in play and exploring together. And this is one of the more, um, um, I guess it's common in our field, but kind of uncommon across other fields. Uh, we really encourage hand under hand exploration. So when encouraging a child to play or interact or even um, be aware of what might be on their high chair tray, um, we use something called hand under hand. So we're inviting that child to come with us to touch and explore, but anytime the child can um, move their hand. So very different than hand under hand. And there's also a lot of research about um, how a child um, can perceive information under their hand that way and how um, hand over hand overrides that. So just three more, we also were working on um, wait time. So providing the child with enough wait time. So being able to read the child's cues and knowing when they're ready to move on or giving them enough um, time to, to process the information or the um, activity that they're working on. And um, observing responses and reactions. So a skill, um, again, that requires being able to read those cues. So closely um, observing student, a student or a child's uh, body uh, language because sometimes they don't have um, language to express how they're feeling. Um, and then also picking up on some vocalizations. And lastly, identifying preferences. So really knowing what the child's likes or dislikes are, and that can help to really drive what kinds of activities and what kinds of toys you have in the house. Um, and then really um, being able to offer those uh, like those, pref those preferred um, items to grow um, different skills. All right, we're gonna list, we're gonna watch the clip of Andy Rose again, and I'm gonna invite you to put in the chat um, some of those strategies that we just talked about. So if you if you can think about those strategies that we just talked about, and now as you watch the video, you have those um, specific strategies to think about, and you can um, pick up on the adult here using some of those strategies when interacting with Andy Williams. Did it again, it's on your toes. Now it's on your mouth. It's on your ear. There it is. All right. Do you have some feedback from the chat? Yes, so we have narration, repetition, uh, another narration, wait time, so pausing and letting the child explore, narration of the play, enthusiasm and delight, encouraging play and narration, um, okay. and delight in voice and tone, melodic tone. Nice. Yeah, well, thank you guys so much for paying attention to those strategies. I, I recognize those as well. And while it might seem um, like little reactions from the adult, it's um, very meaningful to the child. 
All right, and and moving on to kind of trying to piece all this together um, as a as a provider um, in the field of blindness and low vision, and then adding those PFR strategies. Um, really, it was a learning experience for me um, to really add in those social and emotional needs. So, in learning about um, giving feedback to parents, um, I was this was kind of like a new concept. Um, and I was really um, more intentional at like letting the parent know when um, narration is used, you know, how that can help support the child as a whole. So this next um, slide is a handout from the PFR program and it's handout number three. And it talks about the different so social and emotional needs. So we have to feel safe and secure and to feel worthy and to feel loved to feel acknowledged and understood, to feel noticed and receive attention, to understand and be able to manage upset feelings, to feel a sense of control, to feel safe and stimulated in my exploration, to feel competent, and to have mutually enjoyable relationships and feel a sense of belonging. And I love that uh, clip of Andy Rose because definitely some mutual enjoyable um, interactions there. All right, and lastly, tying this all together, um, learning about positive instructive feedback. So in those strategies, um, you know, whether it be repetition or using narration or using hand under hand, um, and then thinking about the different um, social emotional needs that, that those strategies support, um, I think more than anything, making the shift from instruct or from positive feedback to positive instructive feedback was such a struggle for me and it was helpful for me to helpful for me to kind of plan that out and so thinking about uh positive instructive feedback ahead of time um and really having a plan for how you're going to provide that can be really helpful so this next slide talks about you know what is it what is positive instructive feedback so it is a positive um specific behavior of the caregiver um, that you're noting, and then you're talking about how that behavior meets the child's social emotional need. And then we have a great example here that it's so nice how you hold him like, um, like this when you're pra practicing putting weight down through his feet. This helps him feel safe and secure since you're right there giving him support. So positive feedback might be like, it's just great that you're doing that. And then this just gives an opportunity to add in um, that social emotional need that it's addressing. All right, we have another clip here and this is a clip of Christopher. And so what I would like for you to do while we uh, watch this clip of Christopher is think again about those strategies, um, those social emotional needs now and then also um, ways that you might be able to give some uh, positive instructive feedback to this lovely parent. Scented ball. She tells him it's bedtime and then starts their little system. Go to bed and we tell him when it's time to change his diaper and whatnot, but he likes to. He likes to play in bed. That's <laughs> really the biggest thing. Ah, wanna lay down? Wanna lay down? And we have a little system. We try to do things the same so he knows what's happening. It's covered first. Uh, and then we squeak the ball. His mother squeaks the ball and waits for him to reach for it. Oh. You want the ball? Night night. Go night night. What is that? Night-night. Night-night. Christopher is expected to take an active part in this routine. So there was a, a nice clip of Christopher and his mother, and um, they were participating in a routine. And if I had um, the opportunity to tie in the strategies, and uh, the social emotional needs and, and give some positive instructive feedback, I might do it in this way. Um, there was a lot of repetition in that example. 
And so I might talk about how mom uses the same language. Um, I heard her say night night. And um, because it's a nighttime routine, this is something that you can have access to um, over, you know, um, multiple times. Night night happens every night. And then they might even do it at nap time. And then thinking about the social and emotional needs, um, I recognize that you know this might help uh, Christopher to feel safe and secure, um, you know, when he's in this space by himself without his mother beside him. Um, those that repetition really gives him that sense of uh, predictability. So he's laid down, that ball is presented, it's squeaked. He's encouraged to reach for it. He's got the aroma of the scented ball. And then also to have that sense of control. And lastly, to feel safe and stimulated with that exploration, the way that she presents the ball. So I might um, just communicate with the parent and mention that you know, by using those rituals and routines, that she really helps Christopher to learn about familiar things and make sense of his world. So in planning out um, each of the visits and the times that I would go and visit a family, I might take one of these um, strategies that we have been working on, and that could be in terms of something in the home. And with this family, um, we were really talking about transition too. So um, communicating to that school staff about like why it might be important to use these strategies as well. And so using um, this planning document, I was able to put together the strategies um, identify what social emotional needs seem to fit with that strategy, and then really start to think about some of the um, positive instructive feedback that I could plan um, to give um, to the family. Welcome back, everyone. And I just want to invite you to um, participate in a little activity where you can maybe mention one to two words about how you feel about thinking about strategies and practices. Um, you know, with young children in this way. So there is a QR code on the screen. You can access that um, with an external device if you have your phone. And um, if not, you can use the link that's in the chat and that will take you to uh, minty.com um, and you can um, add in the code. Yep. And I somebody added something in the chat. That is, if that feels yeah. better, if that feels better for you, if that feels more comfortable for you, um, please go ahead and add, you know, add your comments into the chat. Let's go to So Beverly said necessary. I love that. Yeah. Empowering. Okay. Oh, you can. Yeah. Well, we have um, if you don't mind, um, Monica, um, please um keep us updated on the chat. And then yeah. um, those that are um, interacting with the word cloud, we have important, helpful, supportive, empowering, um, relieving, soothed, I love that. Nourishing, uplifting. We have awareness, curiosity, relieved, supported. Beautiful. Respectful, comforting, universal. I like that universal, right? Yeah. Um, more than anything, too, these these words are really specific. So not good, not great, you know, words that actually, um, you know, have a more in-depth meaning. And um, it's really that really ties in nicely with what you're with what feedback you're trying to give the parent. Very nice. I like validating too. That's a uh -huh. good and warm. Absolutely. And centered. This is great. I can uh, share uh, the end results with you, Monica, later if you want to get that out to everyone because that might be kind of nice. Yeah. All right. Okay, we're going to move um, on just a little bit and, and talk about um, how that document can be used. Um, thoughts of mine might be to expand to other disciplines. So if you're joining us and you're a speech and language pathologist, you might be thinking, gosh, I have 
um, you know, some really evidence, some really good evidence-based practices. And, um, you know, I could, I could kind of think about those strategies, um, tie them to the social and emotional needs, and then, um, you know, practice my, my positive instructive feedback comments, you know, prior to visiting home. Um, another way I thought of this could be useful is by teaming. Um, if you have a home visit where you're co-treating um, with other uh, disciplines, um, you might have the strategy that you're going to work on um, and then the strategy that that other um, person joining you from the other discipline as well. And so, you know, there could be, you know, other ways to use it. And if you have ideas, you can put those um, other ideas into the chat. And in the meantime, we're going to move on because we're running out of time. Um, I did want to talk about a couple more connections. Um, and real briefly, um, handouts are a really um, important aspect of promoting first relationships. And so in working with um, the family that I worked with, um, you know, sharing these handouts, but also being mindful of the fact that some of these handouts have uh, photos of children that might not be reflective of their children. Their children might not be walking. They might not be looking and pointing. They might not be sitting on their own. Um, so really in thinking of sharing these wonderful uh, handouts and resources, but then also trying to um, you know, kind of tie in the specific um, aspects or the unique aspects of their child. Um, so in thinking about you know, trusting, um, it's important for the child to trust um, and you, you know, can be encouraging to help them learn about the world. Um, this might be a great example, you know, being down on the floor with the baby. Um, baby is, is touching the adult's um, hands here. Um, definitely a, a portrait of, um, you know, support and exploration. Here's another um, photo of a child who is exploring a puzzle. So um, the, the handout suggests, um, you know, stay close, keep me safe, and, and um, you know, show me that I can enjoy things, um, you know, on my own at a distance. Well, when you can't see and you can't hear, sometimes that um, distance might look a little bit different. You know, you might be, um, you know, nearby in proximity, but still allowing that child to have their, you know, independence. And um, lastly, there's a great photo of a, of a little gal that's being um, presented with a, an individual like handheld fan. Um, and this handout lastly addresses about being upset or having an upset feeling and, you know, having that opportunity to be comforted. And so, you know, um, maybe like the idea would be like a hug for most um, kids might be the most appropriate thing, but it also might be for a device, a diverse learner, it might be um, a specific um, vibration or sensation. So that's where that uniqueness comes in there. Um, here's another handout called Teaching Through Play. And um, it really focuses on, um, you know, how the caregiver can do that through um, have uh, teaching experiences and allow the child to have learning experiences through play. So this uh, first kind of um, image shows uh, a child and, you know, the encouragement here is let them touch and explore first and, um, you know, encouraging their curiosity. So, you know, a, a comment might be to provide hand under hand. We talked about that a little bit, letting the child take their lead um, and then uh, using narration. So uh, using repetition, you know, with um, you, um, really specific vocabulary and then also uh, providing wait time um, reading the child's cues, um, and then uh, praising and recognizing that uniqueness in their play, because it definitely can look different from child to child, especially a child with significant support needs. Um, and then this last handout is about developing trust. And so in thinking about having a conversation with a, a family like that, you could talk about mutuality, um, serve and return when a child um, serves, you know, having that return with the child. So, you know, picking up on their cues and re responding um, in a way that's appropriate, you know, having fun during play and learning opportunities, uh, delighting exploration. Um, and then if there is need for um, comfort, um, inviting the child or offering comfort, um, being a partner in play, so there's that, you know, doing with and not for, 
Um, and then also picking up on yellow cues. We're going to talk about that uh, really briefly here in just a second. But those are those cues where a child might be starting to get either overstimulated or upset. Um, and then here's just an example of um, some positive instructive feedback about um, returns. So like your unique returns or your unique uh, reactions support overall development and willingness to explore. Um, in terms of um, this transition for this family into preschool, um, these, you know, unique, the uniqueness of the child um, might not be um, easily um, communicated without some extra supports. Um, so this is an idea out of the uh, California Deaf Blind Services, and it's um, called a personal passport. So really a personal passport you know, helps to um, support a smooth transition. So helping a family to realize um, what might be some specific needs of the child and then um, be able to verbalize uh, those. And this might even be describing how the child communicates. And lots of times this um, includes a child's name, um, lots of photographs, even videos. You can put links for video and is written in first person. I do have a link on here. I'm not gonna um, share it right now, but you all do have uh, access to it. Um, here's another really great uh, resource from Learning First Relationships, and it's called Look What I'm Saying. So um, recently I just mentioned the yellow cues. So in working with the family, you might have a conversation about these cues and what a green cue is, um, you know, like the child wanting more, wanting to continue with an activity and what that might look like. Um, and of course, this um, also addresses yellow cues and red cues. So when a child might be getting overstimulated or it might be needing a break and then, you know, really when a child is, is upset. Um, but again, this, you know, really kind of has that um, perspective of how a, a child might um, um, traditionally um, communicate those cues. And so uh, one really cool thing that happened out of um, me tailoring a lot of the handouts for the parent was um, the parent uh, taking the lead and tailoring that uh, baby cues. And so this is something that, that this parent did all on their own and then provided to the preschool staff. So she took all of the green light cues and um, added in um, what that looks like um, since it, it was a little non-traditional. Um, and then what that communication was, and then um, how the adult in the environment could react and, and help support her social and emotional needs there. And she did that for the green light um, cues, yellow light cues, and then also for um, red light cues. So just an example of, um, you know, me taking the time to, you know, kind of tailor those handouts. And then in the end, um, the parent taking the lead and doing that on her own as well. And then lastly, um, you know, this is just kind of the wrap up from um, the experience that the family had using the PFR program. And um, more than anything, um, it was just an op the parent really saw this as an opportunity um, to learn more and um, um, really valued that creation of that handbook or that personal passport for the child's um, transition into uh, preschool. Um, and she also viewed herself as a trailblazer. So I really like <laughs> that word. Um, and in her um, comments too, she's talking about, you know, ensuring a path to, to success. And she mentions um, how that really um, helped her to feel safe and um, helped her to uh, feel like her child would be safe, safe and understood in that setting. So that's kind of the um, wrap up of the experience um, in that um, PFR training that I was able to go through and the experience that I had um, with the family. And I would just like to open the floor if anybody has any questions or comments about um, any of the information that you heard today.